I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our Medical Alumni Association president. Dr. Cass Fowler is a neurosurgeon practicing in Asheville, North Carolina. He is a graduate of Wake Forest University School of Medicine and did his, res his neurosurgery residency training here at UNC, followed by a neuro-oncology fellowship also at UNC. I proudly present to you Dr. Cass Fowler. Hello, everybody. Uh, just wanted to thank you all for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, I think we have an exciting program tonight that everybody will enjoy. Um, I did want to thank everybody uh, that's speaking today up front for taking time out of your schedules. I know they're all busy to uh, join us on this meeting. Uh, I also want to up front thank all of the members of the Medical Alumni Association office Kathy Harris, um, Todd Dawson, Kirsten Beatty, Megan Hunt, Mary Elizabeth Entwistle, and Janine Simmons uh, for all the work that they do to make this possible. Without them, uh, this would not nearly be as good or as smooth. Uh, they kind of tee everything up for us to hit the home run. So uh, thank you uh, to all of you. Um, some of you may wonder how in the world a guy who went to Wake Bowman Gray School of Medicine became the president of the UNC Medical Alumni Association. And um, residents uh, at the School of Medicine at UNC are included as alumni of the Medical Association of uh, the School of Medicine at UNC. So that's how, that's how I got to where I am. Um, and uh, Later on, we'll tell you more about who else are candidates or who else are included rather in the Medical Alumni Association. Uh, so um, thank you to everyone for being here and um, thank you uh, for all of those who help support the Medical Alumni Association and the university. Um, for a few announcements, uh, uh, I would like to tell you that the Medical Alumni Council is the governing oversight of the Medical Alumni Association and is responsible for establishing and revising the association's policy. Every member of the Medical Alumni uh, Council serves a three-year term and can be elected for a new three-year term. So at this point, I'd like to take an opportunity uh, to have those who are members of the Medical Alumni Association Council, raise your hand. And uh, anyone who has been recently elected or reelected, please also raise your hand. Thank you all very much for your willingness to serve and it's great to have you here. Um, and then I'd like to recognize the members of the Medical Alumni Association Executive Committee. Would you raise your hands? All right, and thank you all again for uh, your willingness to serve. Um, so some, a few uh, other folks I'd like to welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome those of the uh, class of 2020 who are uh, getting towards the end of their first year of their residencies. I hope it's going well. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, I believe we have some uh, class of 21 uh, loyalty fund scholars on the call as well and I'd like to welcome you all uh, if y'all would all raise your hands that'd be great uh, and then um, any other medical students or other folks who are joining us uh, please raise your hands so thank you all for being here um, there's a few business items we need to take care of really quickly uh, an email went out yesterday, I believe it was, uh, which contained the minutes of the fall uh, meeting, uh, Alumni Association meeting, and I'd like uh, a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Okay, motion is uh, carried, minutes are approved. Uh, there was also in that email a slate of officers uh, that was sent out, um, and uh, I would like to thank our nominating committee, which included uh, Dr. Luke Blanchard, uh, Dr. Katrina Avery, Dr. Jim Hundley, my dad, Butch Fowler, and uh, the chair, Dr. Fred Dula. Um, and I'd like to have a motion to approve the new slate of officers. Do I hear a motion? 
I see Dr. McElveen has raised his hand, so he has motioned. Do I have a second? Second, Bright. Okay, and uh, so anybody opposed? Uh, hearing none opposed, uh, the, mo uh, the slate of officers is approved. Uh, and please, uh, anyone on, on the uh, call, if you're interested in becoming more involved with the Medical Alumni Association, please contact my dad, Dr. Butch Fowler. Um, so moving forward, uh, we're honored tonight to have the CEO of UNC Health and Vice Chancellor of Medical Affairs, otherwise known as your Dean of the UNC School of Medicine, Dr. Wesley Burks, uh, on the call to give us an update on the School of Medicine, Dr. Burks. So Kaz and Butch, thank you for the invitation just to talk with you for a few minutes this evening about both the School of Medicine and UNC Health. Uh, if I step back for just a minute, and I've said this several times in recent events here in Chapel Hill, the last year for all of us has been interesting, I think frightening at times, amazing in so many ways. I know here at work, it's been filled with a sense of purpose, unlike truly any other time. Uh, but above all, I know for everyone on the Zoom tonight, it's been hard. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a long year. Uh, sometimes I say it's felt like a decade in that year. Through all of that, though, our faculty, our staff, the students, as you'll see tonight, have really gone above and beyond. They've worked unbelievably hard. For most of them, I know, harder than they ever have before. And they've done it with empathy and grace for each other that truly, as I step back, it's been incredible to watch. What I want to do is to give you a few updates about various activities around the School of Medicine and UNC Health. So I don't think we can start anything without first talking about COVID, uh, the number of COVID inpatients across UNC Health all across our state, like the rest of the country, increased really dramatically from November through February. It started going down precipitously. There was a plateau. And now it's increased moderately over the past couple of weeks. And that's particularly in the rural communities in the state of North Carolina. We have 17 sites across the state including here in Chapel Hill, that we're serving our communities by giving vaccinations. Our team has given over 350,000 vaccinations since mid-December. We talked about that earlier this week, and it's pretty amazing when you step back and think about how quickly they've been able to set things up and do that many vaccinations in a short period of time. And again, I know many of you have seen this, but watching people get the vaccination that sense of relief, that sense of wonder, it's truly unlike anything I've ever seen in my lifetime in medicine. Uh, in the School of Medicine, from a big picture, we're doing well. Uh, the faculty, the staff, the students, as you can see in their presentations tonight, despite the circumstances, continue to thrive. Uh, just to brag a little bit at the beginning, the US News uh, recently released its annual best of graduate schools and the School of Medicine was ranked third nationally for premier care, 24th for research. Uh, in research big picture, our ranking was sixth among public universities. And in four areas, we're in the top 10, family medicine, OBGN, psychiatry and internal medicine. The overall big picture federally funded research continues to increase. Uh, we we're fortunate to have a number of faculty who were working on the coronaviruses literally for decades. And they've been able to make major contributions both to the clinical care, the science, uh, the regulatory work that's been done and the national strategy in this space. And it's been comforting personally just to be able to talk with them and know that we have that expertise here locally. For the students, we recently had match day which unfortunately was virtual for the second year in a row. And it's obviously different to do match day. It's not the same in the way of excitement corporately, but for many of the students, it's, it's or the students really, not many, all the students, it's exciting to find out where they're going. This year, because of the way the interviews were done, they're going places for many of them they've never been to in person. Now they're going to work with people they've never met with. I'm sure all of you can remember how stressful the match process was the interviewing and then you add COVID on top of that and the Zoom interviews and you can imagine what they've been through in the last year. For the students, we had a 96% excuse me, match rate, 31 different states, 
24 specialties, and 40% of the UNC students are staying in North Carolina for a residency. And as I finish talking about the School of Medicine, I want to talk about the LCME site visit, which is the national accreditation body for the School of Medicine, all schools of medicine. The preparations for this site visit started almost five years ago and literally involved thousands of hours from many of the colleagues that we work with. And because of when COVID came, uh, they were going to have an on-site visit and it finally became virtual. And after that entire process, we're excited to say that we've earned our accreditation for another eight years, which is really nice and a testament to the people that we work with. To talk a little bit about, again, the big picture of UNC Health, to ensure that we have an adequate number of patients for our clinical, our educational research missions, we have to continue to grow. In North Carolina and the state, there are several regions in addition to the triangle that we're working with now, areas that we can uh, have an impact on the people of North Carolina. One of them that I wanted to comment specifically on, and for those that are in the state, you may have read some about this, is our work with Novant in the last nine months. It's a health system that's based in Winston-Salem and Charlotte. They're about the same size as we are. We originally announced our intention to partner with Novant to expand our health education and medical branch campus in Wilmington at New Hanover, and then work together on our clinical care efforts focused in higher end pediatric care. And then this partnership developed over time and is expanding to bring educational opportunities to Charlotte. In order to prepare our students here at UNC and Chapel Hill, we know that they many of them need to have the opportunity to train in an urban setting and how important that is. So we, uh, with losing the medical school in Charlotte with the atrium and Wake Forest combination, uh, we wanted to have a presence there and working with Not Novant has allowed us to do that. That campus, not only being an urban campus, it will have a specific focus on health equity with those concepts being built into the curriculum. So our focus in the next few months in Charlotte is on internal education for us, faculty recruitment. We're hosting a series of meetings for physicians and other providers in Charlotte who might be interested in participating. Uh, we've also had informal sessions with our students so they understand and they're aware of our plans in Charlotte. One other big effort that I want to update you on is our work in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion in both UNC Health and the School of Medicine. There are so many issues that we have to address internally as well as externally, particularly in the area of health equity that we just, we can't not address. At UNC Health, in the last six months, we've established a system-wide DEI council that addresses hiring, mentoring, promotions, and leadership throughout all levels. We're in the midst of a national search for a DEI officer who will report to me We've asked Dr. Crystal Sine in the Department of Medicine to lead our efforts in health equity. So a lot and important work going on there. In the School of Medicine, a couple of things I wanna talk about. One, we have a new program. It's an acronym, so stick with me for just a second. It's Students in Training, Academia, Health and Research. So our STAR program. And it's specifically supporting underrepresented students to build a community around our MD and PhD students, our residents, the trainees, the postdocs and fellows and our faculty. It's a year long mentorship program that started in August last year, and it has almost 100 participants and it provides a space for these individuals to support them, be connected with each other, particularly around the challenging issues of race and ethnicity in the, our country right now. We're also launching another new program called MedExcel which will start its first group of students in May. As a part of this program, underrepresented students will receive teaching and training through a really intensive one-year clinical, academic, and professional development curriculum. They have conditional acceptance that next year to the UNC School of Medicine, provided they meet certain milestones throughout the year. Through this experience, they'll uh, be able to build bonds with each other, with faculty, with other students, and we anticipate entering medical school as leaders then and throughout their residency and career. And as I said, that program is launching in just the next few weeks. 
Over the last few months, we've had several meetings with the School of Medicine leaders, our Student National Medical Association leaders. Uh, it's an organization that's represented the underrepresented student populations in our School of Medicine. Uh, the discussions have been good and around the student experience and how we can better support their success in the School of Medicine. I know later you're going to hear from a few of our really outstanding students uh, in the program tonight, and I want to recognize them on their work and their leadership in this important area. In just a moment, I'll be happy to take your questions, but while you're thinking about them, I want to express my gratitude for what you're doing and to say thank you, our alumni, you, for investing your time and energy and resources to ensure the continued health of our School of Medicine. I, I really do sincerely thank you. And now, as best I can through chats, and Kathy, I'll take any questions that you might have. And it's fine. whatever you'd like to ask or have more information about, please feel free to ask now. It's, a, it's raise your hand and I'll get to you, or Kathy will. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Dr. Burks? I see in, in the chat, uh, Dr. Ewan is asking Dr. Burks, what are you looking forward to in the coming year? So I hadn't seen Matt in like two hours and he asked me a question already. <laughs> so what am I looking forward to in the coming year? There's so many things. Uh, one, to see people again personally uh, with more than one person in a room with a mask on. That's probably the biggest thing. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing my kids and grandkids uh, that I've not seen for 15 months. Uh, which is a really long time as you, I mean, I know many of you are experiencing the same things. Uh, I'm looking forward to having our community back, both in the school and UNC Health, that we can see each other and physically be present together. So I think those would be the three things I'd talk about, Matt. And Dr. Sandeep Rahandali from Florida, he asked, when will the medical education building likely open? So the, the medical education building, the, the exciting thing that's happened in the last three weeks, and Matt can attest to this, is the, the, the tower that's built in any major construction went up and it's about, the tower itself is about 15 stories. And for those that are still children inside like me, we go to our window literally every day and watch the construction being done. Uh, it is, uh, they've gotten the basement and the second level kind of where you can see it now. Uh, what we anticipate is in the fall of 2022, we hope to be in with the student classes, uh, the occupancy of the others, the rest of us will be January, February of 23. So yeah, I think they just put in the chat room the construction progress you can follow. Uh, that is pretty amazing to watch. It, it is, for us, it's a really important process uh, to have the building to, again, further enhance the community for learning, particularly in the medical school, but really across the health sciences and across our other training programs at UNC Health. So there's a question, what is the plan for the UNC School of Medicine students in Charlotte, short and long term? So for right now, we have worked with Novant to establish uh, uh, the medical school to go forward that would start in a couple of years. The class that would be entering, they would be able to do their clinical work, which is 18 months uh, in Charlotte. And that will uh, likely be a longitudinal curriculum uh, with an emphasis on health equity that I talked about earlier. Uh, we would like that size of the class to be equivalent to what it is right now, which is in the 30 to 35 range eventually, uh, but it will take a couple of years before we get there to, to build the faculty and the other sites of training for that group of 30 to 40 students.
Uh, look, Kathy, and again, Cass and Butch, thank you for the opportunity. I'll, I'll look forward to the other speakers tonight. Dr. Burks, thank you very much uh, for joining us. We really appreciate your time and insight. Uh, so next, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Matt Ewand. Um, I have known Matt since 1997. Uh, first, when he came to interview for a job uh, when I was a resident, um, and I spent a few time, a lot of time in the OR with him, and a few times in his office getting some constructive criticism. Uh, and, uh, and I've uh, maintain, maintained contact with him uh, since I've graduated from residency. Matt is fully vested in the University of North Carolina. Um, he's been here for over, uh, I think, 20 years now and uh, has ascended from uh, coming here as an assistant professor to chief of the division of neurosurgery to chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery. And his current title, I'll have to read it, is Chief Clinical Officer, UNC Health, President, UNC Physician, Professor, UNC Department of Neurosurgery. And I think there are a few others that are attached to his name as well. Um, he's a great guy. Uh, I think um, besides uh, uh, one of the great things about Matt is that not only is he brilliant, but he's a normal person, I think. Um, you can talk to him. Neurosurgeons are a weird bunch. I can tell you that because I am one, and uh, I've, I've met a lot, and um, they're a, a strange group, and Matt is a very normal, easy-to-talk-to person. Um, uh, he, I, I have also been a patient of Matt's, uh, so... Um, it was interesting being on the other side of the table, so to speak, um, and uh, got great, great care from Matt and the university. So um, he is a great friend, and I think you're really going to enjoy uh, his talk. Uh, one other thing I want to say about Matt is uh, you have at North Carolina one of the uh, direct lineages of surgery. He was uh, a um, uh, in the Hunterian Research Lab at Johns Hopkins University, where uh, that, that is named after John Hunter, who is the father of surgery. Uh, uh, and uh, Matt got an award from the NIH for his oncology research uh, that he did while in that lab. And he worked with Dr. Henry Bream to establish one of the newest treatments for glioblastoma that had come out in many, many, many years. It was a gliadel wafer and in situ chemotherapy for glioblastomas. Um, and he's continued his research to this day. Uh, he's also, also graduated from Hopkins from neurosurgery where Harvey Cushing uh, was, and he is the father of neurosurgery. So an amazing uh, talent to have at our institution. Um, so with that, Matt, I'd like for you to take it away. Well, Cass, thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. That's a really warm introduction, probably better than I deserve, but I will let my children know I am normal and they will be reassured. So that's really good news. So let me uh, see if I can convince our computer to let me share. Cass, is my, is my slide set coming across now? Thank you, Kathy. I see your thumbs up. Thank you all for this great chance to talk together. I'm uh, uh, really looking forward to it. I want to, I chose the topic to talk about what the roles are of doctors in healthcare today. And I think the most cynical among us would say that it's changed and, uh, and not in a positive way over the years. And I've got 20 plus years in myself now. And I, I want to I put forward tonight that things have changed, but that it can be a very positive thing for us. So I'm going to draw on my experience with UNC physicians. And so I thought it's probably important to explain exactly what UNC physicians are and who they are. And that's not as easy a question as you might think. So I'd like to, to draw an analogy that's near and dear, I bet, to many of you, which is to compare that to, uh, let's see if I can, there we go, about the different ways you can become a Tar Heel. So next year, when we can go back to the Dean Smith Center, imagine that you're sitting there in the Dean Dome, a bunch of folks around you, and they probably all or nearly all consider themselves Tar Heels. And you could ask how, they got there and why they're Tar Heels. And so first, the people who played on the men's or the women's team, we'd certainly all agree they won a varsity letter, they are Tar Heels. 
if you attended and graduated UNC, as my daughter will do in a week or two, uh, you are certainly a Tar Heel. If you worked for UNC for 20 years and you have a light blue paycheck, I can tell you that makes you a Tar Heel. And if you were born in North Carolina and you've always followed the heels, then you're on board. If you lived anywhere, but you love Michael Jordan, that can make you a Tar Heel. And then, then my favorite, if your brother was a Duke fan, you're probably a Tar Heel. So all these different ways you could be on the team. And tonight I add one more. If you joined the medical alumni group, you are a resident, a medical student, you worked on the faculty, or you, know, you are part of our group and you are a Tar Heel. So those are all the different ways that you can become a Tar Heel. And they're all valuable and no one walks around the Smith Center saying, which way did you get here? As long as you're wearing the right colored shirt, you're on the team. And so I, I pull up now sort of a, a diagram, if you will, of, of our entire UNC physician group and show you many of the different ways that folks get on our UNC physician team. The, the traditional you know, mo first way was to be part of the faculty, but now we have huge groups of community physicians at Rex Hospital, in our UNC physician network, at our hospitals in Caldwell and Pardee. All those folks are part of our UNC physician group. And then we also have a huge clinically integrated network on thousands of doctors across the state who do not get light blue paychecks, but who are affiliated with us through our clinically integrated network called the UNC Health Alliance that brings them onto our team and, and partners with us to deliver better care for our patients. So this is the group of UNC physicians. And these are the folks that I'm gonna draw experience from tonight to show how we're influencing healthcare. Now, Dr. Burks didn't mention what a complicated system he works under, but I put this up because many of you may think, well, this is great, but I work in a really complicated place. This is a really nice rendition of the system that Dr. Burks and I work under. And you can see that he has many, many folks that he needs to answer to. We have on the left of this diagram, the School of Medicine. We have on the right, the healthcare system. And we have in the middle, the intersection of those two things where the School of Medicine lives. And if you look, Dr. Burks, of course, is himself a physician with a wonderful clinical and research career. The executive dean is Christy Page, a family medicine physician. I'm in the role of the chief clinical officer, a neurosurgeon, and then Steve Burris is our chief operating officer. So within our system, the physicians are um, really key parts of the leadership team, and so our voice is heard. And that's good, but that really doesn't make sure that we really have a culture and environment where physicians are, are going to be empowered. Um, I want to just go and I promised the follower doctors that I would not talk about COVID and I won't, but I am going to talk about how, how our experience through COVID reinforces the fact that physicians are crucial to improving healthcare. And so this is uh, data from our Press Ganey surveys and I, hi, it's complicated, but I highlighted in red what our patients are telling us about how likely they are to get vaccinated, if they trust the vaccine, if they think it works, and it's about 50-50. But if we ask them, do you have faith in your doctor about whether your doctor can, um, can guide you through this? 80% of the people say, I have faith in my doctor. And we ask them to compare the federal government, the state government, our healthcare system, Johns Hopkins, your doctor. And every time we ask people, they say, I have faith in my provider. And one thing that was very reassuring to me is we looked across different groups of our patients and this confidence in their providers you know, goes through our patients who are people of color, it goes to people of different ethnicities. Our patients across the board believe in, the, in their providers. And so that's really reassuring. And in your neighborhood, whether people were banging pots and pans or they wrote in chalk that, that healthcare heroes work here, they are really invested in their doctors. Now, let me show you one example from COVID of how doctors influence care. And this is a big complicated slide, but I put the most important stuff in the red. This is our data looking at who's getting vaccinated. And we're looking at a metric that sees whether we're vaccinating people in the community at the same rate that they live in the community. So if you look, these are all our patients who don't work for us who've been vaccinated. And if you look in that top red box, um, that, that number that I've highlighted is 0.6. That means that we're only vaccinating about 60% of the people we would expect based on the population that we reach. And we're only vaccinating about 50%, 54% of the folks who are of, of um, Latinx descent. But what happens is, as soon as we open another group in the state, um, the people who rush in are the people who have the greatest access to healthcare. And then a physician-led effort at UNC, led by Dr. Crystal Sine and by the, the physician group with many, many partners, reaches out and, and tries to bring um, other folks back in to get vaccinated. So this is just the people 
who are 65 and older. And in North Carolina, those were group two. And at the beginning, on February 1st, you can see that oh, we were only vaccinating 33% or one third of the number of people of color that we would expect. But we, working with our physician groups and in our physician practices, reached out and we talked to folks and we used texting and, and all sorts of ways to bring folks in. And if you now look at our 65 year old patients two months later, you can see that we're now have passed equity and we've reached more than, uh, uh, more than the expected number of people of color and people of Latinx descent. So this physician led but healthcare system driven effort to reach into our communities, flip this from underserving folks to really making a meaningful step forward in, um, in uh, achieving health equity. So a really nice example of physician led partnership with the healthcare system. Now I just draw from the example of redesigning healthcare. And when we think about redesigning healthcare, I think all of you probably in your practices have seen these care redesign efforts. I'll show you one, but it's really about simplifying care. It's about improving outcomes. I think back to when I was a resident, it was just one year after Cass was a resident, right? We, I came in as a faculty member, Cass was the most senior resident, but we were essentially of the same age and I still believe we are. And there was that little antibiotic book that you carried that had the two script figures on it. I think it was called the Sanford book. And that little book carried everything you needed to know about antibiotics. You cannot possibly carry around in your head all of the information that you need to know now. And these efforts to, to redesign and simplify healthcare really help us to get, reach better decisions, to simplify our practice, and I think to, to make it easier to really be successful. And I think we think about physicians uh, working independently, but it's really this effort to work in healthcare teams and to be the leader of a team that has physician extenders and nurses and pharmacists and care managers and folks who do patient placement. That multiplicative effect is really what allows us to have a, a large impact. So I show you an example of this. It's one that's important to all of us, which is um, an experience in um, in opioid prescriptions. And so we started, again, a physician-led effort uh, four years ago, an effort to reduce uh, opioid prescription. And we did simple things. We set up our system so that they defaulted to show up, to give us the number of pills that we ought to prescribe. We got our doctors together, our surgeons, our emergency department physicians, and we said, how many pills should we give out to folks? And we put these practices in place. It made it easier for us to do our job because the right answer appeared in front of us. And you can see the dramatic reduction that we had in post-surgical opioid prescription. In 2017, we gave out 3 million doses. And in 2020, we gave out 1.5 million doses. And I see Dr. Burke's face, but I can reassure him, we didn't do half as much surgery. If anything, we're doing more surgery, but we're much smarter about how we do this. And it's easier. And so this physician-led effort is good for patients. It made our practice easier and really impacts our communities. Um, a pivot now for a couple of minutes to talk about how we're going to get paid for all of this. So this should come as no surprise to any of us, right? But everybody thinks that we should be paid less and we should do the same amount of work. And uh, that's, uh, that's really a challenge because healthcare is not getting less expensive and we probably need to be part of that solution or let someone else uh, put that solution in place for us. So this is the UNC healthcare system that Dr. Burks leads and you can see that we span across the state from Hendersonville in the west down to Onslow County in the east and um, we're up to I think it's about 13 hospitals now. We, we care for so many people across our state and we're we're a successful system meeting the mission uh, which is to serve the people of North Carolina and to improve the care they get and to reduce their suffering and to improve education and research but but we've been very successful in the fee-for-service world and we see the value world coming and we don't want our mission to be undermined as the way that healthcare is reimbursed changed so starting in 2012 we made a commitment to to step forward and to develop our pathways uh, to participate in value care. So let's talk about value care, right? Now, first of all, I'll show you this. This is a, a little cartoon figure that shows someone trying to keep their foot in two different boats. That was not uh, professionally done. I actually drew that myself, which I know will surprise you. And so this is how it might feel when you're in you know, a fee-for-service and a value-based 
care world at the same time. And so our first goal was to at least get ourselves like a catamaran where we have these two different efforts working together. But the dream eventually is to pull it together into one big, beautiful ship that works well in that world. So I know there's a lot of resistance uh, to this thought of changing uh, to a value-based world. And the analogy that I frequently use with our folks goes back to my second of the basketball comparisons for tonight. And so in 1986, there was a major change that occurred in basketball. And I just leave a minute for folks to think about that and see if you know what it is. Um, should not come as a huge surprise, but it was the introduction of the three-point line. And so with the introduction of the three-point line, guys like this, who had been the stars of basketball, were still important, but guys like this became a, a lot more important. And so if you think about it, what changed and what didn't? Well, the court was still 94 feet long. The same basketball was used. The basket was 10 feet in the air. You got five players on your team. If you could run fast and jump high, and dribble and shoot and pass, you were gonna be valuable. And frankly, it was still good to be tall. Sorry, Cass. But uh, some things did change. The outside shooters became more valuable. The defenses changed, the offenses changed. The shorter players were able to impact the game much more. People who ignored that or late to embrace it, they were left behind. And a coach or a player could love it or hate it, but if they didn't adopt to it, then they were gonna be disadvantaged. In a way, uh, uh, value-based care is the same way. For us as providers, we still wanna provide high value care. We don't ever wanna harm a patient. We wanna work with an engaged team. We wanna make a good living. But some things have changed, right? The people who are skilled at taking care of a patient across their, their whole uh, health journey, who can work across a system, who can view things as more than a single episode, work in teams, uh, uh, deliver care that, that gets the same outcomes for less cost, they're advantaged in the system. And so what we did was challenge our teams, and I hope all of you feel you're a part of this, to find ways to participate in value care. And we built this out and again, in a physician-led effort, and Dr. Mark Gwynn, who's a family medicine physician, leads this effort for, for UNC Health, build out ways to really do this. We pulled in that whole 6,000-member clinically integrated network, and we worked with them, brought them tools to improve care and to improve quality. And I'll just show you what the impact of that is. This is the results of our uh, value-based efforts over the last few years. The next generation ACO is a Medicare ACO for patients over 65. And you can see that our quality performance has been very high. In 2019, we were the top next generation ACO in the country for quality. The first year in the next generation ACO, we lost some money as we found our way. But in 2019, we had $14 million returned to us and we'll do even better this year. Blue Cross, for those of you in, live in North Carolina, is pushing a very similar model they call Blue Premier. And again, we're seeing really good performance and quality, which is really uh, feels good for our teams, but also we're, we're reducing the cost of care and that those, um, those uh, rewards are coming back to our system. And we, we move a lot of that money back to the providers who delivered that care and we in, invest the rest back in efforts to improve this value or, or care that's based on, on good health. So another example where physicians are really changing the way that we deliver care and, and leading, again, in partnership across the system, but certainly with a strong voice. Now, this is a, a, a beautiful diagram of the work that we started two years ago um, on a journey uh, to what we call One UNC Health. And I am gonna take just a minute. We put a tremendous amount of work into drawing this, so it feel like it ought to stay up for a few minutes so we can all look at it. But take your eyes down to the bottom, maybe start on the bottom right with me. We're a system, I showed you the map with 13 hospital entities, five physician entities or more, many other groups. And we had a lot of excellence, but we were very siloed. And that's what those uh, silos, right, represent. And you can even see that one special silo over there for the UNC School of Medicine that has the, um, the old well on it. And a lot of excellence happened, but we were working in parallel. And so we've launched this journey to center around the patients, which are at the very top of this diagram, and then to, to really reach out and drive to these shared upon goals. And so you see in the next row up from the bottom, the unified operating model, and you see on the left, the UNC physicians, which um, is really an effort to bring all of those physician groups, not that we dissolve into a single group and lose 
the, the identities of these groups and the strengths and the different areas that they work, but they work in a coherent way under a single set of vision and goals to really achieve good outcomes. On the right, you see the regional operations. Those are the hospitals and the triangle and statewide coming together again to really work. And, and what are they working on? Well, that's our unified strategy, right? And that's those three bubbles across the middle. Leading in research and education, obviously a heavily uh, physician and scientist and teacher driven activity. Transform patient care and integrate clinically, again, about bringing our teams together um, in order to serve our patients. And so what are the roles of the physician side of the shop in this, the physician, UNC physicians? Well, we're really focused on quality uh, everywhere that we see patients. We're working out bringing in the best physicians into our group and partnering, whether that's joining our clinically integrated network or joining our system. We have a, a, an effort to bring our, our um, services together that I'll show you on the next slide. We're trying to align our incentives so that they really drive towards uh, the activities that we want folks to pursue, quality, value, uh, wellness, uh, um, physician satisfaction. So we really want those incentives not just to be how many brain surgeries did Casser I do, but how good outcomes did we get? And then we are really focused on health equity and I showed you one nice example of that. And so just as I wrap up here, this is an example of the specialty programs. These are uh, groups of physician-led teams partnered with the hospitals across these important specialties. Sometimes these are called service lines, but, but really starting with physician leadership, bringing these groups together, pick gastroenterology. What do we need to do to bring our community and our academic gastroenterologists together to better serve our patients? What are we going to do in research, in education, in clinical care? Where do we place key services? How do we work together? And, and then the power of doing this in a physician-led way across 14 and then even more specialty programs, really been a, a beautiful example for us of, of physician leadership within our system. So let, let, me, let me just wrap up and then maybe we have a minute or two for questions. I, I did, uh, you know, 2020 was a very transformative year in healthcare. It, it really had some terrible costs, um, but, but it reminded, I think, our communities of the importance of our healthcare system. I felt that as a physician, I was reminded of the critical role that our nursing colleagues play in caring for patients. And as I walked into the hospital and I saw where people had you know, written in chalk along the path or put up signs, it really reminded that, me that what we do every day is really, really valuable. Each of us needs to define what we mean by this topic I've discussed tonight, influencing healthcare. Am I involved in influencing patient outcomes? Am I involved in helping to reduce total cost of care? Am I involved in trying to change my work life so that it's a better work life for me and I'm better at my job as a result of that? And am I deeply involved in, in if I want to be in our system decisions about what are the direction of the system? What are the strategic plans? Where is capital going to go? Um, I feel really good that at at UNC Health that we are empowering our physicians to really help drive where we go, not by ourselves, because it's really a partnership, but with a big voice. And, you know, we've really got to be willing to embrace change to make this happen. I sometimes tell a patient who has a, I do mostly brain tumor work, who see, who has a brain tumor, but, but maybe doesn't need to, you know, do anything that day, they still feel well. And I say, you know, sometimes taking no action is not the right step. Imagine you're dropped on the middle of the highway standing still and doing nothing, and even though you're fine right at that moment is not the right way forward. And there's a, a saying that we like to say that the thinking that got us here will not get us where we wanna be. So I think embracing and leaning into change and trying to make sure that it goes in a way that you think is really positive for your patients is, is the best way to influence healthcare delivery. I often think about what we'll say to students who are entering or looking at a career in medicine, and I, right now today would say to patients that there's never, or to students, I'm sorry, a better time to take on a medical career. We've never had more tools or more knowledge to help patients. And if that's really our motivation for getting into this, then it should be a really exciting time to be a physician. We should be able to improve the health and the well-being of our patients and reduce the suffering that they have. So I thank you all for your time this evening. I'd be really happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, and I uh, um, open the floor. Again, thank you, Cass, for the chance to be with the group tonight. 
Matt, thank just, you so much. Uh, I, 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 I guess the best way to ask questions is in the chat room. I, I don't have the whole screen up to see people raise their hands or I guess people can speak up. Um, I had one question. What do you think the issue with uh, one of your first slides, why the American Indian population has had such a problem with the vaccine? Oh, I think, I think our, our um, Native American population, in, at least in North Carolina, is generally among our more disadvantaged group. And uh, um, I think it's been harder for healthcare systems to, and others, because it really shouldn't be the healthcare systems who drive vaccine delivery. It should really be across the whole spectrum of health to, to build trust in the, in the communities. Um, We've had great success in Lumberton, UNC Southeast, or UNC Southeast, which is in Lumberton is a new hospital joined our system, and and the the um, Lumbee population there is is really high, and they've done a beautiful job of connecting with that group, and the, and it's the trust they built over years that allowed them to get folks uh, comfortable with vaccination. But it's really it's about trust of the system. It's about people within that community stepping up, and it. it it's not very powerful for me to show up uh, to, a, to groups and tell them they should get vaccinated. But when their neighbors and their friends and the people they look up to in their communities get vaccinated, that really resonates um, locally. And so that's really the strategy that we need. And we're in a, let's be honest, we're in a race between the variants and the vaccines. So I'm, I'm hoping and betting on the vaccine. Other questions from anyone? You you mentioned um, with the morph the opioid that you got information somehow about the correct amount of pills to get to give. Where did that come from? So we we data we looked at the uh, number of doses that we were giving out and we pulled patients and asked how many they were using and counted pills in studies and. You know, it's terrible. I had a knee scope. I got 30 Dilaudid and 90 Percocet. You know, I think I took a Percocet the first night and then I'm left with 119 pills and nothing to do with them. So um, it really, patient satisfaction has not dropped. Patient's pain release has not dropped, but the, you know, the misuse of those leftover pills is really a health emergency. And so it was really data driven and it's really um, worked very nice. And we built dashboards and we measure for patients and we help count pills. And, and you, I, I assume uh, there's multimodal pain med, uh, multimodal, multimodal pain medication given. Absolutely, I think that was the other real lesson was it doesn't have to be all narcotics. That there's right, so many right. good ways to treat pain. I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. This is Noel McDevitt in Pinehurst. Matt, uh, I have two questions. The first uh, involves uh, what one of the chief justices of the Supreme Court said years ago about pornography. He couldn't define it, but he knew it when he saw it. Uh, and I wonder how that uh, applies to the way we measure quali quality now in medicine. We're really not sure with, uh, how to define it, but we know it when we see it. Uh, you have a, a, a little... Uh, uh, view about that or certainly do so first of all it's one of my favorite quotes yeah and um the 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 problem it runs up to is the quote that sort of you have to put up on the slide side by side is if you can't measure it you can't improve it right so i agree that there is art in medicine and and when i talked about standardizing things i believe in that 80% of the time. And I think the art, of course, and the skilled practitioner knows when to follow the pathway and when to come off the pathway. I think with quality, uh, there are so many things that we can improve that can be done with pretty good definitions and, and agreed upon measures. Uh, but the art never leaves medicine and you'll always have some general disagreement about exactly what we're aiming at. But I think Fewer people dying. I think we're all pretty good with that as a measure of quality. Uh, fewer readmissions to the hospital, fewer people uh, having complications of chronic disease. And then I think you're going to see a big pivot to patient reported outcomes and patient uh, 
I want something better than satisfaction. I want improved quality of life and better living as a result of health. And I think those more and more will become measures of what we've done. And I don't want to ramble on too long, but when we look at quality, the first year we put a goal in place that's a process and we say, I use depression example, can we, uh, can we count how many times we screen for depression? The next year we put in a goal that says, what can we do about it? So we say, how many times when we, we detected depression, did we give a prescription or appropriate therapy to that patient? And then by the third year, hopefully we say, hey, are fewer people depressed? And so following that pathway um, is really important. But I think you're really getting at the art of, of medical practice. And I hope that never leaves. Well, when you talk about uh, the uh, application of guidelines and so forth, uh, and the uh, 20% of those who follow it, uh, you wonder whether or not as time passes, there's going to be more and more pressure to, for people just to follow the guidelines and uh, not use their own thoughts and so forth. I think that's yeah. one of the problems that we might see with guidelines. In fact, we, uh, yeah. we see it now really in some respects. No, I think that's a good point. I would just say when I get on Delta Flight 6243, I kind of want the pilot to follow the guidelines nearly all the time. And um, so people draw on that experience. I think wild variability probably doesn't produce better outcomes overall. And there's always a small subset of people who are so good that they always make the right choice. But some agreed upon best practices, um, I think, will help us overall as a group to achieve better. And then I, the other thing I would say is things are changing so fast now and the information we have to know is so large that if we don't rely on our colleagues to help us pull together what is now the best way to treat this particular problem and allow that shared set of guidelines to bring along our knowledge base, it's really, really hard to keep up. But I'm not a proponent of 100% cookbook medicine. Just think some of the unnecessary variation leads to some unfavorable outcome. Well, there's no doubt that everything that happens to a patient is uh, dictated by a pen in the doctor's hand. Uh, and uh, people need to realize that because that's where the direction really comes from. Now, if I could go to one other question and that uh, involves the situation in Henderson County and the party physicians group, could you make a little comment to us about exactly what may be happening there in Hendersonville vis-a-vis -vis Asheville? Uh, certainly, the, um, the, the party physician group, I think, is, is doing excellent work and taking care of the folks of, of that county, and we're really proud to have them as an affiliated part of our system. Uh, for those of you following the press and other things, know that, and I'm looking at Cass, that things have been a little different in Nashville with changes in the healthcare system there, and that the, uh, the role of the physicians in the healthcare systems appears to be changing in the community. So um, we're, we're watching for that. Our fundamental goal is to try to help to ensure good health for the folks in that community. Cass, I don't know if you wanna offer any insight and I don't know how we're doing on time. Well, we were just about up for this segment. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the healthcare situation here is, um, I, I think that within my group, certainly we're still taking great great care of our patients, but it, it has been a time of change um, uh, on multiple levels with a new wing of the hospital opening, stressing things, and a new group taking the hospital over. And so it's been a big adjustment. And uh, I hope that it will smooth out uh, over the next uh, few years. Um, we'll see. Um, Cass, there is one last question in the chat, yeah. if we just have a second. Um, Rivers Woodward asks, in a large organization, how do you ensure that system innovation is supported with rural clinics or satellite hospitals that are not in the center of action at UNC, fostering the trickle up ideas rather than simply trickle down of policy, so to speak? Yeah, great, great question. I realize that may not be a great question for winding down in the last second, so. I can, I can, I'll give you the 30 second answer and you can call me and give you the five minute answer. Um, we remember North Carolina has the second most citizens who live in rural uh, environments of, of any uh, state in, in the country. So that's a really important part of what we do. We're, we're built much more on a Senate model is probably the quick answer. So we tend to have representatives in equal numbers from each of our entities rather than saying, well, there's 1,200 docs in, in the faculty practice, so they get 1,200 votes and there's only, you know, 100 that are working out in the rural community. So we have equal 
number of folks in our quality committees and our leadership committees from across our different entities. So we get perspective that I think is uh, equally weighed to folks working in a rural environment as in, as in some of the bigger environments. I think it's also an important part of our core mission is to try to help solve the, the difficulty of bringing healthcare to rural environments. I, I agree that's like, it's a, and will be a constant challenge, but it certainly has attention and we hope we've built the structure to bring voices in from across the state. Good program, thank you. Thank you, Matt, thank you very much. Um, uh, so we'd like to move on to the next segment of our program and uh, what this involves is uh, how the first year medical students adjusted to uh, the COVID uh, situation and being pulled off of their clinical services and how they pivoted and began to serve their medical community in the pandemic. And um, so we have a panel of students, uh, Tia Andrade, Jesse Bossingame, and has Demi Canutas been able to join us as well. Um, the, uh, Dr. Georgette uh, Dent, who's the Associate Dean of Student Affairs is gonna be the moderator of this panel. And I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Dent to speak now, please. All right, good evening, everyone. And I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. And some of you have heard me say this before, but you know what I love most about our medical students. It's not that they're smart, because there are smart medical students everywhere. What I love best about our students is that they come here because we have a culture of leadership and service. And our students really perpetuate that. And so Tia and Jesse are just fantastic examples of this. And so what I would like for Tia and Jesse to do, and we'll start with Tia, I would like Tia to briefly introduce herself, tell you where she's from, tell you what campus she did her application phase, formerly known as the clerkship year, and to tell you a little bit about what COVID has meant to her and some of the activities she has been involved in in response to COVID. And then we'll have Jesse do the same thing. So Tia, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Sounds good. Hey everyone, um, I'm Tia Andrade. I'm a, well now starting fourth year medical student. Um, I did my application phase at Charlotte at the last class at Atrium actually. Um, and I'm from Charlotte, which factored into my decision to go there. Um, and I guess um, what drew me to Charlotte was definitely the urban setting. I'm a Keenan urban scholar. Um, and COVID has really impacted um, how urban populations, specifically underprivileged populations, have been um, treated in Charlotte. And so um, that's played a role in how we've uh, done our service projects here. Um, three main service projects that I was in um, was the paramedic ride-alongs. So uh, Atrium um, wanted to triage their patients. And so I'm sure that many hospital systems have developed this. Um, we've had the virtual hospital. So patients, you know, not sick enough to be in the hospital, but who need some monitoring at home um, were sent to the virtual hospital. And prior to its really vast development, um, they sent paramedics out to the houses to take vitals, set up video chats with physicians and administer breathing treatments. And so um, students who had a background in EMS, but also were just interested in helping out in the community did this. And um, I did a couple paramedic ride along shifts. Uh, so that's one thing I did. Another thing um, is we have the Poison Control Center for North Carolina here in Mecklenburg County. Um, and at the start of the pandemic, they created the COVID-19 hotline for the entire state of North Carolina. So 
many of the Charlotte campus medical students, um, including myself, worked for this COVID hotline and we took calls from all over North Carolina on triaging patients with symptoms on whether they should go get tested or not. So this really helped um, decrease the burden on our emergency room system. Um, and then we also helped out our ER physicians with PPE cleaning. Um, so they're all wearing these respirator masks and a lot of the students would go in in shifts and clean um, the PPE for them. So we could have just continuous availability on shifts for all of our physicians. Um, among other things in Charlotte, uh, I had a couple classmates do um, testing center volunteering, so registering patients and also actually COVID testing. Um, we had meals for kids, so a lot of uh, Charlotte um, kids are um, on free and reduced lunch, so uh, that was a main meal for them during the day. So we packed lunches for kids who are on free reduced lunch and uh, they were available at certain hospitals like University Hospital um, for the kids to go during the day and get that free meal that's typically promised for them. Um, and then we also did some babysitting for um, all of the physicians who were working extra shifts. So those are among a couple things that we've done in Charlotte, um, as well as continuing our programs um, that we typically do. Uh, there's one called hot spotting. Um, where we uh, identify high utilizers of the ER and we go into their houses with a interdisciplinary team which involves social work, um, health psychology, uh, social work, and we partner with UNC Charlotte um, to continue this. Uh, so we did that during COVID as well. And a lot of our patients needed masks, they needed cleaning products, which we were able to provide. And the PATCH program, or Propelling Adolescents Towards Career in Healthcare, um, focused on uh, Title IX schools, I believe, um, that just are really under-resourced. A lot of um, low socioeconomic students um, in high school who uh, got the opportunity to experience healthcare um, before applying to college and getting help from medical students on applying to college. So those are things that we've been doing in Charlotte um, and it kept us definitely busy when we were taking it out of clinicals. So if you guys have any questions about the Charlotte campus or um, what our last class at Atrium is up to, let me know. Thank you so much, Tia. And now let's hear from Jesse. Yeah, Tia, you must uh, be a little bit better at multitasking than I am. I didn't quite manage to cover quite as much many things in my time. Also, I think Demi is now on the call. She just walked out of the hospital, so she should be able to hop on in a second. Um, so I'm Jesse. I'm originally from the north and from Wisconsin. Um, came down here just for medical school um, after a, a physician at UNC allowed me to shadow him, and I saw what the place was like and got really excited to be in a place like this. Uh, I did my clinical rotations in Asheville, partly interested in their longitudinal outpatient primary care focused curriculum and also because the mountains are beautiful and I'm a sucker uh, for that. So it was really nice to be out in the uh, natural spaces, especially once things got a little bit more locked down. Um, I, at the start of COVID, I had been working with Dr. Jeff Heck um, in his clinic in uh, a nursing facility out there, doing my interest in geriatrics. After we were pulled from our clinical rotations, he gave me a call the very first day and asked if I wanted to see if I could get a group of these interested, excited medical students together to do something important. Um, as all of the rural clinics across uh, the Mayhack catchment area were having trouble getting patients in and getting uh, telehealth set up and getting the PPE they needed and knowing how to make the clinic safe for the COVID population. But uh, there, one, wasn't a good solid list anywhere to figure out where all these clinics were, what their phone numbers were, and two, they didn't have the staff to call all of them. So I worked with Casey Scott, another class of 2022, wonderful student who did amazing research work to pull together a list of all of the clinics that we could find, one of the first times anyone's pulled together a list like that, 
And I recruited uh, a bunch of students at the actual campus, including the lovely Amanda Antona, who's also on this call, uh, to call all those places, working together with the Shuck Center in Chapel Hill to uh, generate data to allow Mayhek to reach out to each of these clinics, get them the PPE they needed, get them the resources they needed to start up with telehealth, um, get them the resources they need to access billing and the Congress uh, assigned funds for places that lost business due to COVID. And so I try to keep these little uh, practices afloat in sort of one of the biggest crises of their career and keep them safe for the pop like underserved populations. Um, I also worked with several students to do some screenings for unhoused populations in Asheville proper, which has a major unhoused population, um, trying to reduce the spread of COVID among uh, this group of very vulnerable people. And then Casey is on the call, but I wanna give major props to, um, worked with UNC Asheville to 3D print PPE equipment um, when it was really in a shortage and built the designs and got them out to medical, all of us medical students who then went and dropped them off at clinics around the area. It was a really exciting time. Um, and you, know, you just have this group of students who are all excited to be here and you know, see what they can do. Thank you so much, Jesse. And Demi, if you're on the call, if you could just briefly introduce yourself, tell us what campus you rotated at, and just a little bit about some of your COVID-related activities. Yeah, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Demi Canudis. Um, I am currently driving back from Wake Med right now, so I apologize if the quality of the audio is poor. Um, I rotated at Central Campus for my third year, um, and early on in uh, the pandemic, when we heard about the PPE shortages, um, three of my um, fellow classmates uh, started uh, seeing what we could do to um, try to make some PPE. We reached out to infection prevention at the hospital, um, and they said one of the um, pieces of equipment that was in the lowest supply was face shields. Uh, so we started making prototypes with materials from like Joanne Fabrics and the Home Depot. Um, and we were eventually connected with the Be a Maker Space or BEAM on campus. Um, and we were able to partner with the engineers and the team there to um, design um, a reusable, uh, um, durable face shields. Um, and uh, we would go back and forth between um, clinicians uh, to see you know, like uh, size uh, format um, and the engineers to come up with a design. Uh, we put together a team of volunteers, um, some medical students, um, like nursing students, dental students, professors, um, to uh, come together to assemble these space shields. Uh, we were able to make 40,000 shields um, and some of them uh, we were able to donate to local clinics um, who just did not have the funds or the um, um, uh, status to be able to uh, buy scarce PPE at that time. Um, and um, we were also able to um, sell some to local clinics to help defray the cost for the donations. All right, thank you so much. So I, I just want to say how proud I, I am of what Tia, Jesse, and Demi have done. You are just fantastic, you know, representatives for the School of Medicine. Um, you know, I'm I'm just I'm just so impressed by the way that you took this opportunity and tried to provide service to the community. And I was wondering if uh, if everybody on the call could just give these students a you know a, a round of applause, show your appreciation, and and let me just add that um, some of the other students on this call also were really involved in this, but if we had all of them talk, we'd be here all night. So we wanted to just limit it to three and give you a sense of what was going on at the different campuses. And I think with that, uh, I think I will turn it back over to Cass. Dr. Dent, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and all of the medical students, thank you so much. I tell you what, I am, so thankful that I got into medical school when I did because the 
quality of students that are getting in now, I, there ain't no way I would have gotten in. Um, so thank you. And Jesse, I know part of the reason you love Asheville too, it's gotta be the beer. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, moving on to our next section, um, I'd like to uh, call on uh, Dr. Rahangali, uh, the Dean, Associate Dean of Admissions of the Medical School, to give us an update on the admissions interview process uh, and how things are uh, with the admissions process in this uh, time of COVID. Dr. Rahandali. Thanks, Dr. Fowler. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so if you're wondering what it takes to get into medical school, I mean, um, you see that um, these are, you know, these students that you'll, you heard from and you'll hear from today, they just um, represent so many wonderful applicants that we see every year. Um, and so, you know, pivoting towards admissions, um, you know, as everyone did in all settings last summer, we had to quickly pivot to a virtual um, process for admissions. And so we were able to quickly and creatively do this. And I'm so proud of our team and our faculty and all of our students who pitched in to review more than 6,700 applications and conduct more than 700 interviews in the virtual format. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting. We were concerned about how are we going to do this? Are we really going to be able to connect with people? But, you know, uh, as all of us have kind of gotten used to Zoom, uh, we were able to connect and we were able to do it. And we did interviews with um, groups and one-on-one um, -on -one, and it was really interesting and, um, and we were able to get the information we needed. Um, Despite the restrictions of the pandemic, from an admissions perspective, it's been a great year. We actually notably had a 12% increase in applications from um, North Carolina applicants. And this has been one of the most competitive and diverse groups I've seen um, from all over the state. And so right now we're in the process of building our class. We'll still, soon start working on our wait list and have started awarding scholarships. Thanks to the generosity of many of you here, I can't tell you how important scholarships are for getting the best and brightest to our school, while also supporting students who may not traditionally have seen themselves in healthcare, but are really vital to our future and our communities. Um, and so, you know, in terms of what's going to happen next, we have decided to continue to do virtual interviews next year again, because we don't know what direction we're going with the pandemic and we wanted to keep um, our campus and our um, applicants safe. And so, you know, even though we may not do virtual interviews forever, we do find out, find that there are advantages in terms of logistics and for costs for applicants. And so I'm really interested in seeing where this will lead after the pandemic. Um, so that's my report in terms of updates from admissions. I'm happy to take any questions. I know that we're a little behind schedule, so um, I'm happy to cut it short too. Lisa, I have a quick question for you. Last year, um, you mentioned the focus on um, team-based interviews and, and um, uh, applicants showing that they work well with others. How are you able to do that through Zoom? So we ended up having, um, a scenario that they had to discuss. And then the, um, the interviewer, the person doing the assessment was in the room with them, but they would turn their camera off and then follow their discussion. And then they were based on that activity, they, well, that discussion, they had to actually conduct an activity. So for example, um, we taught them how to do a root cause analysis, and then they worked on it on the whiteboard on Zoom together. And so that was just one example of something they did. But you know, it wasn't perfect, but that was part of it was that like things aren't perfect when you're working in a group together. And so how do you manage that and um, and still get things done? So that's just one example of um, something. We just made it a virtual activity or a, a computer based task as opposed to maybe something you would have done with your hands. Lisa, Sherry Jordan, there's a question in chat. Uh, about the Fauci effect. We like to call it, of course, the Francis Collins effect. Um, was there a change in the number of applicants? If you'll recap those numbers one more time. Sure. 
our, to um, our total number of applicants were, was basically around where we usually are, but our um, overall applicants from the state of North Carolina was um, more than 12% higher than years past, like several years past. So, um, you know, I feel like the Fauci effect can't happen that fast because it takes a long time to be prepared to apply for medical school. So my sense is, is that we're going to be seeing that in the years to come as people got interested in medicine and, you know, more people are applying. But, uh, or maybe a lot of people said, okay, this is the year I'm applying because, you know, it, um, I'm excited about it now. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Rahangali. Oh, yeah. I really appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay. Um, well, we'd like to hear again for some, from some medical students about uh, student government. So next on the agenda, we have uh, Amanda Antono and Josh Evey, who are both uh, class of 2022, and they are the co-presidents uh, of student government, and they're both loyalty fund scholars. And I will tell you, um, having reviewed applicants for the loyalty fund scholarships, uh, the quality of, of the people who apply is, is just unbelievable. Um, and uh, so kudos to you two for receiving those scholarships. That's it's just fantastic. And it's a co fierce competition, I can tell you. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction. Um, my name is Josh Av. I'm a MS4 who just began individualization phase. And I'm Amanda Antono, and I am also a new fourth year medical student. As the current student body presidents, we wanted to first start with a quick update on where each of the student cohorts are on their medical education journey. Starting with the class of 2024, who are currently in the foundation phase, they just finished the GI block uh, as part of the preclinical curriculum and they are about to start the MSK and dermatology block, followed by a summer break. For the class of 2023, they just finished studying for step one and began their core clinical clerkship year, which we call application phase. The class of 2022 has just begun their fourth year rotations, or as we call it, the individualization phase and they are beginning to work on residency applications and preparing for this upcoming interview cycle. The class of 2021 recently had a really successful match day. As Dr. Burks mentioned earlier, we had 96% of students match into 24 specialties in 31 states plus DC. And plans are currently underway to make a meaningful and impactful graduation for students in a virtual format. To briefly share some of our goals as the UNC School of Medicine uh, student body presidents for our tenure um, leading student government, we hope to spend a lot of our time focusing on rebuilding the community and conductedness at the UNC School of Medicine as we hopefully transition to more in-person events in a safe way. And we also hope to continue the previous efforts to support student initiatives to address social justice reform within the School of Medicine community and ensure adequate support of students from all backgrounds. We also wanted to share some exciting recent and upcoming events that were sponsored by student government. Um, this year, we hosted a virtual college cup for the college advisory system, which culminated in a trivia night where Dimmick took the cup. We also will be having skit night, which is happening on Friday. We're excited to see the skits that our students came up with. We always love seeing enthusiastic involvement from faculty and staff. And word on the street is that Drs. Dent and Steiner are in a couple of the skits. Yes, we, we know that for a fact. And the skits are going to be beautiful. Um, some other exciting events are the What I Learned in Medical School speech competition. This occurred this past Friday. 
And for anyone who's interested in listening to the amazing student speeches featured in this year's competition, a YouTube link to the performance can be found on the Medical Alumni Affairs website. The last update that we wanted to share is regarding our spring apparel sale. Our lovely MS1 Foundation phase presidents are currently planning the spring student government apparel sale, which serves as a fundraiser to help uh, raise money for student government. And this will include some alumni specific items. If anyone here is interested in purchasing UNC School of Medicine apparel, both alumni specific or just in general, um, and helping support the student government fundraiser, please check the Medical Alumni Affairs website in the coming week for more information. And finally, we just wanted to thank the Medical Alumni Affairs Office for letting us provide y'all with this brief student government update. Uh, we're happy to take any questions that you might have. It looks like there's a question from Dr. Margolis. How are our students performing on those step one and step two exams? Actually, that may have been for Dr. Rondali. Yeah, we might not be the um, best prepared yeah. <laughs> to discuss that, but we can talk about uh, the student perspective, which is that there has been an extreme amount of support and effort put towards helping students succeed on the step one and step two exams. So from a student perspective, there is increasing support to help us succeed on these very crucial board exams. Yeah, and yeah. also, I, I was just gonna add to that, um, in terms of step two, I can just speak to a personal experience that I feel like our clinical um, clerkships really prepare us to do uh, a lot better on step two than um, studying for step one. So it, it ends up being an easier transition to study for an exam when you've had the clinical clerkships to back it up. Yeah, it, it would take me a few minutes to get the details for you, but I can tell you briefly that our students perform above average on both exams and um, that our passing rate is above the national average. So, so we, you know, we're, we're doing well. And, and anybody who wants more information, feel free to contact me because I can totally get into the weeds about this. But briefly, you know, that's the high power view. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Amanda and uh, Josh and Dr. Dent uh, for that, uh, very informative. I also see that uh, Dr. Jordan is modeling some of the uh, apparel and uh, swag. Uh, so you can put her on full screen to see what you can get. Um, that's right, that's right. We're, we're at the, we're at the <laughs> 830 mark and it's time for some levity. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hereby uh, endorsing um, uh, the uh, spring apparel uh, sale. It's outstanding and um, I, I had to rip this off of my uh, my hubby Stuart, so they they're actually well uh, well received and well worn. And uh, this is a Yeti cup, so uh, I hope some percentage of the proceeds uh, go 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 to the go to the school uh, because it's it's lovely and uh, not inexpensive, but a uh, good percentage goes to the school. So I do want to I, I do want to endorse that um, at the at the at the 8.30 mark here. Very good, why did you wait till 8.30? <laughs> well, that's I'm because just... They, just, they just discussed it. All right, gotcha. Okay, well, let's move on. Um, I've mentioned loyalty fund uh, scholars uh, and I wanted to call on uh, Ted Kerner, uh, who is the chair elect, uh, national chair elect of the Loyalty Fund Scholar Program uh, Fund uh, to give us an update on that. Ted? Yeah, thanks Cass, appreciate uh, the opportunity for the Loyalty Fund to talk about money and um, the many ways which um, you can part with it. Um, I, was asked to, to, <laughs> I was asked to talk about why I give, why my wife Lisa and I give, but I think we all know how important it is to give to our school, to our medical school, and I think we all have um, a variety of reasons. Um, I will, I will um, 
tell you one reason that that we have enjoyed, which is um, by giving, we've we've been in some fashion, and it may be removed six or eight degrees, but we've been able to remain associated um, with what I think most of us con would consider greatness, and that's our school. Um, whether it's the faculty, whether it's the students, whether it's you, the alumni, um, I think we see that um, that greatness every day, and it's just you know it's a I think it is much. Um, a privilege to be associated with that as it is um, to be a physician. Um, one of um, the initiatives that represents, I think sort of represents that uh, greatness uh, is the current campaign um, that, uh, that we've been in for a number of years here. I think that our development team at UNC for the School of Medicine and for the um, healthcare system in general really is unmatched. I mean, I, I've, I've gotten to know some of them over the last couple of years, um, a tremendously talented team. Um, one of those leaders um, is Martin Balkum, who's the vice president for the UNC Health Foundation. And I'm gonna hand over to Martin and let him run through some really, really um, terrific numbers. His slides may not be quite as entertaining as Dr. Ewins, but um, they'll be just as informative. Thanks so much, Ted, for that very kind uh, introduction. I am, do you bear with me just a second. Okay, so uh, the first slide that you see here, I'm, I'm going to share first, as Ted said, some uh, information on the campaign for Carolina. Um, which is the university's four and a quarter billion dollar campaign um, that is going to run um, eight and a half years total. When it's all wrapped up, we've got 20 months uh, left, and this runs through the end of calendar year 2022. Um, the numbers that you see on this slide, however, are uh, those that are specific to the UNC Health Foundation. Of course, as Ted said, the Health Foundation is responsible for raising funds for both the School of Medicine and for UNC Health, uh, and for helping individual donors as, as well as corporations and private foundations uh, achieve impact in the, the three-legged stool sort of of our mission, which is, of course, education, research, and patient care. Um, UNC Health is responsible for the, the largest single share of the university's total. Um, we're the only uh, unit on campus that has a, a B for a billion after our vote. So we, um, we're starting for $1 billion in this campaign and remarkably we're um, very significantly ahead of schedule. So um, as you can see, we've, we've uh, passed about 78%, uh, just over three quarters of the campaign's duration. And we've raised 94% of the dollars that we set out to raise. So we're well ahead of the schedule. And we anticipate that sometime in the next several months we're going to surpass uh, that uh, remarkable milestone. That's a, a great achievement, of course, um, by our donors and alumni like you, uh, principal. And then that includes also grateful patients, uh, their families, our leadership, uh, certainly faculty. Uh, and the care providers, um, as well as our staff. As, as Ted said, we've got a pretty good team uh, here uh, at, the, at the Health Foundation, and it's certainly uh, true for our medical education and development professionals who are, are on this call. What's really more important however, than the counting of dollars um, are, of course, the lives that, that all of you as donors will have an impact upon, and, and that's why we uh, we certainly don't intend to stop when we hit a billion dollars. Um, we intend to really double down and roar uh, through the last 18 months of the campaign to see just how many lives we can improve. So, um, you know, our goal is to, I guess, not only to, to provide opportunity for, for students like Tia and Jesse and, and Demi, uh, but also to impact the lives ultimately of the patients that they're um, they're going to achieve. So, um, we, uh, like I said, we don't uh, intend to slow down at all. So next slide, um, this is uh, how we're doing um, when we break our, our goal down into priority areas. So, um, you'll see advancing health um, is uh, uh, comprised of a, a lot of different areas uh, of the Health Foundation, the School of Medicine, um, certainly neurosciences as well on track. Uh, medical education uh, is actually doing re remarkably well. Um, you know, all of these other areas, uh, 
totals actually include uh, private grants or grants from uh, non-governmental sources, um, a lot of corporate dollars, and that's really not true of uh, medical education. So that's um, you know almost fifty-five million dollars raised so far, almost exclusively uh, from individuals and uh, and alumni yourself. So really doing exceptionally well in that area. Um, you'll see there at the bottom, cancer is about to meet its two hundred million dollar mark for the campaign. So we're really proud of, of the accomplishments in all of these areas. Um, next slide. This is kind of how we're doing in the current fiscal year 21. Year, we'll end at the end of June, so um, yeah, we're past the, the three quarter mark. Um, and, and this is a comparison really of uh, this fiscal year versus last fiscal year. And you'll see that we are tracking ahead uh, of where we were last year. Um, the really significant thing about that is that almost all of last year's results. Um, that you see here on the screen came prior to the pandemic where uh, all of the dollars raised uh, this fiscal year uh, certainly happened uh, during the pandemic. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, proud of the team because of, um, you know, when we were sitting there last March 13th, um, thinking about how we were gonna reinvent the way that we do our business, uh, we certainly wouldn't necessarily forecast uh, that we'd come out ahead of where we were at that time. So, um, like I said, we, we do, I think with a strong closeout in this fiscal year, we will get pretty close to that million dollars and then we'll take off from there. Um, to support medical education, and I mean, first and foremost, you know, I mentioned that three-legged stool, it all starts with education. So just a few numbers uh, to share with you. The loyalty fund, uh, which Ted just referenced, of course, is $8.6 million for its uh, $10 million dollar goal, which is really incredible. It'll be a push to meet um, by uh, December 2022, but it's still very possible. Actually, I guess I think I misspoke. And there's $10 million left to raise uh, for the Loyalty Foundation to achieve its goal, uh, but we certainly expect uh, to get there and we'll push hard for it, as I know you all will. Um, the $10 million faculty support goal uh, for medical education has been achieved, and that's uh, thanks to um, in large part, an anonymous bequest, and we, we love bequests. Certainly, um, they are the way that institutions um, really build up money over time uh, that will persist and, and support students uh, forever and ever, really. Uh, but current use funds are also exceptionally critical, and so we will be putting a, a hard press on for, for more of those in faculty support. Uh, $48 million goal for student support is progressing really on pace as alumni and friends are. Uh, investment in scholarships and awards uh, in particular. Uh, and then lastly, the medical education building, which um, Dean Birch talked about earlier. The fundraising con continues uh, for that project. Rooms are available to name. And to date, um, 23 of them, I think, have been named, claimed. Uh, we hope to see a, a lot more of those named in the coming months. Um, it's a great way to honor alumni and friends. Certainly, corporations and foundations are. are uh, many opportunities um, for us to pursue, and it's a tremendous investment in the future of uh, the School of Medicine. We've raised uh, $5 million toward that $32 million goal. Uh, and there are some really big conversations happening right now, so uh, we expect to, to be able to share um, hopefully later this year uh, some really exciting news. And uh, we'll certainly uh, include you all in that and, and you've been such a remarkable uh, part of the success so far. I just thank you very much for all the impact that you've had on uh, this wonderful school of medicine. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Ted now to share some more with you. Yeah, I think you're muted. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Obviously that's impressive and um, we know you'll blow through that one billion, um, one billion figure. And we, we have a lot of people to thank. I do, Cass mentioned at the very beginning, but I do want to um, mention again and thank the um, medical education alumni development team within the UNC Health Foundation, and that's Janine Simmons, Kirsten Royster, Mary Liz Entwistle, and Megan Hunt. Um, and many of you know them, have worked for them, and will continue to do so, and we appreciate their, um, their efforts. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more, just a little bit more about Berry Hill. Um, uh, it's you know you can you'll see you'll see more of it here in, in just a second, 
But um, just like um, there's a new curriculum, and it has been for a year or two now in the School of Medicine, uh, we need a new medical building, uh, new medical education building. Our school's not necessarily defined by bricks and mortar, but we need the spaces that will enhance um, the medical students' experiences and better prepare them on their journey to becoming um, physicians. It's, um, it's really important um, that we follow through with this building. Um, and while many of us have spent days or evenings or weekends um, in this building, and, and I'd love to hear stories um, and anecdotes, I will ask if you've got some, please send them to the medical alumni office. Um, take a moment, jot them down. It'd be fun to uh, publish those, which um, which can be considered for public consumption. So, if you really, if really, if you have some, uh, send them into the office, and um, be fun to collect those. But it's also imperative that we um, that we get this building because Berry Hill doesn't exist anymore. So, um, we're going to roll the tape now, so to speak, and you got to pay very close attention to this because. It only lasts 30 seconds. And once the building was gutted, the bricks and steel came down in no time. And there it is, there's the big hole. Um, and I think it's, I think it's, from an engineering perspective, it's fascinating they can do all that demolition and construction um, wedged in between all these other buildings. Um, Berry Hill is no longer there. And I think we've got a slide, you saw it earlier, maybe we have a slide of the um, new building, which is, um, this rendering is, uh, I mean, quite impressive. And I encourage you to take some time when you have it to, to look at the, the layout. Um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a fascinating, fascinating building. Um, I just wanna wrap up comments on Berry Hill by simply saying, you know, you can be part of this um, or all of this, and many of you already are, I know many of you um, contribute to student scholarships, faculty support, research, and clinical areas of interest. Um, but I'm really here to talk primarily about the loyalty fund, um, and we're gonna finish up here. You know, a $10 million um, campaign is, it's a, that's a lot of money, maybe not so much in the, in the, in the context of a billion dollar plus, for medicine, but it's extremely important. And I think that um, we need to remember that the loyalty fund is an unrestricted fund um, that is designed to address um, rapidly um, those enterprising students and faculty um, who have ideas or initiatives that they wanna bring forward. And I just wanna highlight two examples uh, very briefly. Um, one of which is sort of a collective example when the, um, when the international um, clinical and service opportunities for a number of medical students were canceled because of COVID, Loyalty Fund stepped up with nearly $100,000 in support to allow those 24 students to um, experience research opportunities in other areas or other locations. Uh, as, as part of that, the Loyalty Fund also um, provided support for students who were presenting papers or posters um, at a number of conferences, which were obviously um, virtual. The, the example I think that really highlights the mission of the Loyalty Fund um, centers on a group of students who um, wanted to create a surgical simulation lab um, so that they could gain some experience prior to their clinical rotations in surgery. They approached the Department of Surgery and who um, pol politely declined. Um, they then came back to the Loyalty Fund, an MAA office and Loyalty Fund, and the Loyalty Fund quickly stepped up to provide the seed money that allowed the students to secure the materials they needed, also to secure the faculty needed to, um, to teach this simulation lab course. And the course was so successful that uh, Department of Surgery has decided that they're going to fund it for the coming fall. So, I mean, it's just, it's a terrific example of how um, students initiated um, the need, um, 
the sourcing wasn't where they thought it might be. And the loyalty fund, your dollars, your unrestricted dollars, which aren't tied to anything, were able to step in and, and support that. Um, so, I mean, we know that there are many needs in school of medicine and, and UNC healthcare, and there are many ways um, for us all to support that. But please, please, please remember, no matter what your past, your current, or your future commitments are to other areas, um, please consider a gift and not just a gift, but actually an annual um, ongoing gift um, to the Lloyd Oak Fund. It really, um, it really has a tremendous impact. So thanks again. Um, I appreciate, thanks for the time. Uh, by the way, just last, uh, last comment, the um, annual National Loyalty Fund uh, Committee meeting is gonna be held virtually um, Tuesday, April 7th at six. Everybody's welcome to join and you'll have the opportunity to hear more about the surgical simulation lab course and the other students um, who are supported by the Loyalty Fund. So look forward to seeing you at that meeting and look forward to your comments about Berry Hill and look forward to your checks in the mail. So thanks again. Okay, uh, we're running a little behind. Um, Ted and Martin, thank you so much. Uh, I, I echo uh, Ted's um, sentiments with regard to this being an un, the loyalty fund being unrestricted. I think that's a key component of that fund. Um, and I, Wow, what a job. I, re I remember hearing that the medical school uh, alumni and whatnot was responsible for $1 billion of this for all kind campaign. And I thought, holy cow, how in the world is that ever going to happen? And it's almost, almost has. That, that's just incredible. Um, so kudos to everyone. Uh, and uh, we really, that is just amazing. Um, so next, uh, we'd like to hear from medical students again, uh, and this, this uh, segment is, involves the untold story uh, of the Black experience at the UNC School of Medicine. And this is gonna be led by uh, three of our medical students, Herman Freeman, Candace Barr, and Amani Sweat. So please take it away. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amani Sweat, and I'm a third year medical student. Hello, everybody. My name is Herman Freeman, and I'm a first-year medical student. Good evening, everyone. My name is Candace Barr, and I'm a third-year medical student here at UNC. And we want to start off with just saying thank you for allowing us to be here tonight and be able to present um, this initiative that's in its infancy stage currently, but we hope to get up and running um, starting at UNC, titled The Black Experience at UNC School of Medicine. So as um, we think the Black experience at um, UNC is so important because as Thurgood Marshall once stated, in recognizing humanity of ourselves, of our fellow beings, we pay ourselves the highest tribute, which we hope to do with this initiative. Um, and another thing that James Slade, the second African-American student at UNC School, in UNC School of Medicine stated, everything wasn't perfect in Chapel Hill, but I have never doubted my decision to go into medicine and I never really regretted going to Chapel Hill. And we just think this is so important to share his story and st other people like his stories um, that made significant contributions to di the diversity and the history at UNC School of Medicine. So we also wanna just take a moment to acknowledge the mission behind this project and what we're hoping to accomplish. So through this initiative, it is our hope to honor the black and brown history at UNC School of Medicine by highlighting the black and brown alumni experiences and contributions that were pivotal to the history and diversity at Carolina. And we also wanna acknowledge the people behind this initiative. It is truly a collaboration between the medical students, alumni and administrators. Um, we have been have the most amazing support from our amazing medical alumni affairs office, from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, as well as Nicholas Graham of UNC's own Southern Oral History Project. So it's a project we're really excited about. And one of the reasons why we're presenting this to you tonight is to hopefully uh, get some um, rally behind us and maybe even be interested in joining the committee and giving us um, contributing in that way. As Tar Heels, we pride ourselves on diversity and inclusion, and this project gives us the ultimate opportunity 
to showcase the black and brown history at UNC School of Medicine, as well as increase cultural confidence on campus. This is also the perfect opportunity for a collaboration between medical alumni and medical students and a chance to form strong relationships. Some unique aspects that we envision in the project include we want it to be interactive as a timeline through the decade showcasing inspirational quotes from alumni. Uh, it also will include interviews from alumni detailing their experiences at UNC School of Medicine, photographs, and medical artifacts. And we can guarantee that we can all learn and grow together as a Carolina family. And this illustration right here is how we envision the project. And it was created by Ms. Alexa Holloway, who was a third year medical student here at UNC. So hopefully um, we would like you all to get involved and hopefully encourage you guys to be interested in joining the committee, whether it's sharing your ideas or sharing your story. We encourage you to contact the medical alumni office. We'd love to hear from you and I know they would love to hear from you as well. And we have their contact information on the screen below. And um, we just wanna take the time right now and to thank um, Todd, Kathy, Dr. Fowler and the medical alumni office as a whole for continuing to support us and connecting this student led um, initiative to the resource needed to kind of get this off the ground. Um, and we can welcome any questions or comments at this time. Good evening. Uh, I'm Butch Fowler, uh, Associate Dean for Medical Education, uh, Associate Dean for Medical Alumni Affairs. We were so honored when this innovative group of students approached our office with this timely idea and the possibility of financial support. Uh, this is the medical students project and we were humbled to be able to point them in the right direction or hopefully the right direction and enable network connections with our medical alumni, School of Medicine faculty, and other university personnel. We're currently in our 13th month of working from home and elsewhere, and we're getting the job done. Uh, obviously, we miss hearing our medical student voices in the hallways that uh, they always were coming by our office and stopping in and uh, having friendly chats and participating in grabbing my M&Ms that I always have in my office. Our phone lines have been transferred to all of our mobile phones and uh, we're available to serve you. So please don't hesitate to contact us at any time. We still have a great presence in Bondurant uh, as our electronic medical alumni message board is continuously running and updated. We currently have over 125 slides of our current scholars, teaching professors, announcements and random pictures of our medical alumni. Todd, who is the guru uh, keeping this uh, going, has done a magnificent job with this. Uh, and I'm gonna repeat what I have said at every one of our meetings that we've had, uh, that if you uh, have a kid, if you have a friend that has a kid that's interested in going into medical school, I would be more than happy to talk to them about what we're looking for in medical students. I'd much rather see them before they apply than after they apply because so many times you, that you could just tweak a few little things uh, to uh, uh, at least that they could be aware of about what we're looking for. Uh, so uh, please uh, get in touch with me uh, and uh, we always track uh, our alumni kids and how they're doing and uh, but just again uh, I want to drive this home. We're currently in the midst of all of our spring uh, reunions, um, celebrating the classes in and in sixes and uh, ones, including my own uh, class that we just had our 55th uh, class reunion. That tells you how mature I am. I don't like the word old. Uh, although we feel the end of the pandemic is on the horizon, we don't know what platform our, our medical alumni fall events uh, will occur because we have to do what the university says. And so they may not, uh, we may not be able to have any of these. Of course, so we'll continue our virtual format. Uh, and we all realize that virtual formats uh, don't take the place of hugs and handshakes and uh, libations and all the other things that uh, we do. Uh, just a general reminder that for those of you interested in seeing some of our brilliant students work, uh, there is gonna be the John Graham Student Research uh, tomorrow. 
Uh, you can go on our website and find the connections uh, about how to get there. Again, uh, I want to thank all the people that have, uh, I hope, made me look good. I know my office looks good, uh, but between uh, uh, Cass has already gone through all of uh, the uh, uh, people that have uh, made uh, things very successful, and I've always said, if you want to get the job done, uh, surround yourself with good people that know more than you do and uh, let them uh, do the work. And I'm very blessed to have that. Uh, a special thanks to my son. I'm very proud of him and all the work that he's done. So uh, again, thank you for uh, coming and joining this. And remember, you always have an office uh, in uh, because uh, we'll have a place for you in our office. Thank you so much. Go Heels. Well, thank you, everybody, and thanks, Dad, uh, for that. Um, I just wanted to conclude with thanking everyone for allowing me to represent uh, the Medical Alumni Association this year. It's been a great year. Um, I, I am literally, uh, I guess, born into the University of North Carolina. I was born at the hospital. Uh, my son, uh, my, my daughter was born there. Uh, my dad is, is a legend there. Uh, my mother went to school there. Uh, I remember first memories, some, some of my first memory, memories were walking in the catacombs of the hospital with the pipes and the low ceilings with my dad when I was a, a toddler. I also remember several visits to uh, the emergency room for misadventures when I was a kid and the only doctor I would let see me would be Dr. Ed Norfleet, uh, who, as many of you know, was a fantastic guy um, uh, and uh, spent undergrad there, left for a little bit, came back for residency, um, had a great experience in residency. Uh, and it's been, it's been great uh, being part of the Medical Alumni Association and the uh, council and the executive committee been a fantastic experience. Uh, kind of referred to myself as the ghost president because I've, I've never held a meeting in person. But for me, that's not necessarily a bad thing because of my fear of large rooms with a lot of people and getting up in front of them. So this is actually much easier for me to deal with. Um, so with that, uh, I want to thank uh, obviously my dad uh, for all of this as well, uh, more than just the Medical Alumni Association, but life in general. Um, and moving forward, uh, you, you have now uh, your incoming president who is, uh, uh, I think, much more, uh, what's the right word, um, extroverted than I am. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce your next president who will take office as of right now, and that's Dr. Sherry Jordan, class of 1985. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna yield uh, virtually every moment of my time. I do wanna ask everyone, however, to turn your camera on. Everyone turn your camera on, please, or as many of you who are willing to, uh, and, uh, and I want us to smile and look at one another. We are, individually and in aggregate, the future of our medical school. We reflect our history, we reflect our now, but most importantly, together, uh, linked arms, uh, e either literally or in the case of tonight, virtually, we are our institution's future. I'm honored to be your new president, and I would like to stay on afterwards uh, to hear um, any suggestions I'm actually uh, requesting suggestions as to what the platform should be for uh, our academic year. Um, uh, kudos and uh, shout outs to um, uh, co, um, the co-executive committee. Thank you all very much. I'll stay on. Kathy, I think you're going to introduce now, correct? Actually, we have one final piece we want to play. Um, exactly. As all good Tar Heels, we always like to end with Hark the Sound. So here's a special rendition that Todd's going to share with us. So link arm in arm and 
pretend we're together. Wow, that was that was excellent. Gave me chill bumps. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this meeting. And uh, please check the uh, website frequently to look at opportunities through the uh, Medical Alumni Association office. Uh, I think uh, there there's so many things, ways to get involved, and in, uh, things that you'll love through that office. So, thank you, everyone, for attending. And we're going to stop the recording and keep the room open for anyone that wants to stay and chat with, with our new president, Dr. Sherry Jordan. <laughs>